At the start of Episode 1, rebellious colonists have brought Wilmington's administration to a standstill while Claire waits for her chance to go to court and proves she didn't kill Malva. Jamie is desperate to get back together with Claire with Ian's help. Meanwhile, Roger's training for the ministry exposes him to an unanticipated moral dilemma. Here is everything that happened in the season premiere. Despite the fact that Jamie hasn't heard from Claire in a while, he is confident she is still alive due to their spiritual connection. In order to free Claire from prison, he chooses to travel to Wilmington. In addition to accompanying Jamie, Ian has asked his Cherokee allies to help him deter criminals from the ridge. Claire's cell is dark and ominous. Sadie Ferguson, another inmate, has been awaiting a hearing on a forgery allegation for at least a month. The judges, according to the other prisoners, have been hiding from the rebels for two months, which has prevented a trial from taking place. Both the trial and the punishments are being handled by no one. Given that many of the inmates' male guards were ordered away to protect the British garrison at Fort Johnston, Mrs. Tolliver, the jail's attendant, is likewise unaware of what will happen to the inmates. Some soldiers approach while the women are cleaning up and inquire as to if any of the women are healers. Sadie assists Claire by lying about the accusation she is up against while Claire claims to be the healer. Although they do not disclose their intended destination, the soldiers inform her that someone needs medical assistance. Bree travels with Roger to his ministerial training assignment as Claire remains detained. Roger is asked to provide spiritual counseling and prayers for the soldiers and prisoners of war at the request of the in-charge reverend. Roger is told by one of the troops that they need guns, not the Bible. When Roger is asked for advice on the battlefield by a prisoner of war, he responds by invoking Muhammad Ali's well-known proverb, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Roger is unfortunate, since one of the men in this gathering is time traveler Wendigo Dunner, who instantly understands the phrase's origin. In season six, Claire heard a prisoner whistling, and now the mystery has been resolved. It was Donner, whose mission to organize the Indians to rebel against the white imperialists had failed, and he had made an attempt to escape the 18th century. Donner could hear the stones, but he was unable to get through. Roger claims that in order to use the stones, you must concentrate on a specific location, but he is unsure of all the technical intricacies. Although Roger is aware of his tale, he is unsure of how he can assist. Bree is adamantly opposed to Roger aiding Donner when Roger tells her about his interaction with him. She properly harbors resentment at Donner for not intervening to prevent Claire from being kidnapped and raped in Season 5. According to Roger, it's likely that Donner froze out of terror after being threatened by the men. He remembers a time when Stephen Bonnet tossed a defenseless child overboard from his ship. Despite her rejections, Bree persists in her belief that Roger would aid Donner and walks away. Later, Roger runs into Bree to let her know that he has made the decision not to help Donner with his escape preparations. He declares that he will pray for him to find a way to rescue himself. In doing so, he is carrying out his ministerial duties impartially and taking Brianna's feelings into account. Claire is rowed by the troops to a boat anchored off the shore of Wilmington. Governor Martin uses the ship as a refuge from irate North Carolinians. Mrs. Martin, his wife, is the patient aboard Claire. Vomiting and sweating are side effects of Mrs. Martin's pregnancy. For Nasa, Claire suggests drinking ginger tea. Mrs. Martin questions Claire about the allegations of witchcraft and the murder of Malva's unborn child during her examination. According to Claire, she is innocent, and the lies are the exact reverse of what she swore when she took the Hippocratic Oath. Because of the loss of her last three children to miscarriage or sickness, Mrs. Martin is anxious about this pregnancy. Claire reassures her by mentioning that she also had a miscarriage. Claire asks to sail back to Wilmington to pick up additional medical supplies, but the governor refuses. The British are in risk of losing total control of the colonial administration because they lost Fort Johnston. Although he does dispatch soldiers with Claire's shopping list, he orders her to remain on the ship until Mrs. Martin gives birth. Tom Christie, who is back on land, receives Claire's message and begins to gather the items needed. After ruling out the jail, Jamie locates Tom and asks him where Claire is. He hands over Jamie Claire's letter, in which the ship's position is disclosed. Jamie sets off to meet the governor the following morning. Jamie's request for Claire's release on bail is rejected by Governor Martin, who then orders him to round up 200 men to help the British Army in exchange for Claire's freedom. Jamie departs to decide what to do next. Jamie and Tom Christie cross paths once more, and this time Tom Christie asks Jamie for help. He claims that in order to get Claire out of Gov Martin's care, he will confess to killing Malva. 
Jamie is understandably upset that Christy didn't offer help sooner, but he reassures Christy that he would describe Christy as a decent but obstinate man if he were to deliver his eulogy. Claire finally set free, but Tom still has a confession to make. She stumbles across Christy in the city after being freed and decides to meet with him. She is informed by Christy that his confession would be made public in the press. He acknowledges that Malva was his niece and not his biological daughter. His brother Edgar was killed after being deceived by her mother, Mona, because Malva created the broth that resulted in the flux poisoning. He thinks she was a witch. Christy also admits that he has been harboring an unrequited crush on her for years and that he loves her. Claire later tells Jamie about their encounter. Jamie thinks Christy may be confessing to hide the fact that Brown or another unnamed lover murdered Malva. Claire ought to take Christy's confession as a sign of love and forgiveness, he says. Christy must go to spy Claire's wishes, but it is too late to stop him. Brown and Jamie cross paths unexpectedly. According to Brown, his militia is prepared to take on the Cherokee guarding the ridge. He also made fun of Claire, which made Jamie hit him. As the audience is eager to learn what occurs next, the episode fades to darkness. Will Brown receive the beating he merits? Will Tom Christie be executed for killing Malva? Does Wendigo Donner discover a way to get away? Tune in to next week's episode of Outlander to find out.